Children, uh, grades K through second, you're invited to be uh, dismissed. Uh, Elizabeth is heading over here. If any of you are going to Children's Church, you can make your way over to the door now. All right. This morning, I want to take just a moment to introduce our, our speaker this morning. Um, as many of you know, I coached Metro football, which is Little League football, the last couple of years. And um, the last year, uh, one, of, one of the persons who helped me really knows a lot more about football than I do <laughs> is, is Justin Ullum. And Justin and I got to know each other uh, through working together with our kids. Uh, and one day we had lunch, and he shared with me uh, kind of his story and uh, what God has been doing in their life. Uh, and Sandy, his wife, is coming this morning to share with you a little bit about uh, what God is doing. They, they've been um, uh, living here in Muncie. Gr- grow, Justin grew up here in Muncie. Did you? No, I, I didn't think so. But Justin grew up here in Muncie. Uh, were away for a while, came back, and God worked in their lives, bringing children into their lives, um, some naturally and some through adoption, and uh, has brought them to this place where they are today. Uh, and they're going to share about this, this vision for ministry that they have uh, here in Delaware County. Uh, it's been uh, several years, uh, this vision, and now is really coming to fruition. Uh, and as we talked, uh, I brought uh, this ministry to our leadership team, and, and we became one of the supporting churches uh, at the beginning of this year. And so I thought it would be great for them to come and share more about this ministry. And maybe there are some of you who would want to be involved on a greater level of, of support, and it's an opportunity for you to hear more about that. So I'm going to invite Sandy to come now. Thank you. It's good to be here with you this morning, and uh, we're so thankful for churches like this one uh, who are a part of, of Treefort and what we're doing. As I began to think uh, about how to share about Treefort, the image of, of the table continued to come to my mind. And so I want to show you some pictures of tables this morning and, and share with you the story of Treefort and, uh, and some ways that, that Jesus is, uh, is working in us as we continue to move toward this dream. This first table is uh, the table where I spent a lot of hours of my childhood. This is the table in my parents' home. We would share everything from those extravagant meals where my mom would take out the handmade tablecloth that her mother had made for her and, and pull out her fine wedding china and meticulously set the table to celebrate Easter or Christmas or some other uh, celebration to the, the evenings where we'd have a microwaved hot dog because we'd had a long day of practices and work and school and all those things when, when there's hardly even time to get a meal into your stomach at the end of the day. To those hours, my sister would spend loathing that last bite of food that my dad would insist she finish. We spent hours at this table doing homework, playing games, all those things you do as a family around a table. We each had our own seat at this table, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, and I, and we never changed. We all sat at the same place no matter what we were doing, whether it was a meal, whether it was homework, whether it was a game. We had our seat at the table. And these chairs all uh, nicely match. When I was growing up, they didn't look like that. My mother had gathered ones that were mismatched and painted them all red. And we had a special way that we would mark our chair. In our family, when my mom went to the grocery store, she'd bring home the bananas, and there would be a race that day to the bananas to grab the sticker off the bananas. If you were lucky, you'd get a batch of bananas with two stickers. Because we'd take those stickers and we'd put them on the back of our chair, and those marked the chair that was ours. My brother was a lot faster than my sister and I. He had a lot more stickers on his chair. But that's how we marked our spot at the table. We had our own place, that place where we belonged. Treefort has been a dream of Justin's and mine for for many years. And with the help of a lot of people, with a lot of work and a lot of time, we're on the brink uh, of becoming, of the dream becoming a reality. It's an exciting time. And the mission of Treefort is to recreate a healthy family environment for boys whose lives are in crisis. We want to provide these boys a safe place, a place at a table, a place where they belong, this place of safety and belonging that they have perhaps never known. When my oldest son was in first grade, he went to school here in Muncie, and I would help out at the school, and I noticed a little boy at lunch would take a bite bite of his apple or a couple bites, and he'd put his partially finished apple in his pocket. 
And then he'd take his little bag of chips and he'd only eat some of it and he'd stick the rest of it in his other pocket. And at first I thought that was kind of peculiar activity, peculiar behavior. But as I got to know him more, as I learned his situation and about his family, I realized that while my son was taking his leftovers from lunch and just dumping them in the trash without a care in the world, this little boy was preparing for later. You see, when he went home, his home was an unknown. He didn't know if there'd be anybody there to help him with homework. He didn't know if there'd be an after-school snack or food in the cabinets for dinner that night, much less someone to, to make it for him. And so he, at lunchtime, at six or seven years old, was preparing to make sure he didn't go to bed that night with a growling stomach. It's boys like this that Tree Fort is being built for. Or the boy, our, our elementary school, now our boys go to Eaton Elementary. And our principal tells us of a boy the last day of school right before summer was hiding in the computer lab. She couldn't find him. And, and while my boys are jumping off the bus, running up the driveway, they're free, right? Two months of freedom, no school, no homework, no teachers to tell them to sit still and be quiet. This little boy was hiding because he didn't want to go home. Because for him, summer was two months with no supervision, no structure, no one to, to greet him with a smile in the morning and to be glad he was awake and ready for another day. It's boys like this that Tree Fort is being built for. Those boys who have never had a table at which they belong. I mentioned that uh, the mission of Tree Fort is to recreate a healthy family environment for boys whose lives are in crisis. One of the things we've learned through these years of preparation is that if a child, <clears throat> by the time he's about 9, 10, 11 years old, if he finds a place of safety to land, that almost no matter what has happened to him in that first part of his life, he can fully recover without any professional help. As an adult, he'll never need the, the services of a mental health professional because he's found that safe place. And that's what we at Tree Fort want to provide. Four and a half years ago, a home and six acres of land was given to us. And that is, is really the thing that jump-started us into the process of, of beginning to make this dream a reality. And for the fa past four and a half years, we have been preparing one of the things uh, we've been doing to prepare is remodeling the home. It's, it's needed a little bit of work to make it a, a, the right place for these boys. And so with the help of a lot of volunteers, uh, a lot of people offering professional services to us at uh, free or discounted rates, we've been able to remodel this home. It's almost completely done and, uh, and be ready for that piece of tree fort to begin. Volunteers are something we're going to need to continue to have as we move forward with tree fort. When boys move in, hopefully later this year, uh, we'll begin to have boys living there. We're going to need people to help us. We're going to recreate a family for these boys, but we'll have up to six boys in this family. I have five boys of my own, and I know after school is hard. They're all in different classes. They all have different homework. They all need help with something different, and there's only one of me. And having that help for these boys who likely will be behind academically after school during homework for tutoring, or maybe it's a ride to practice because the parents at Tree Fort are pulled six different directions trying to get kids to this practice and that lesson and this appointment. We're going to need volunteers who can step in and help us, be those aunts and uncles, if you will, those babysitters, those people who can become mentors in the boys' lives. If time is something that you can give, that's a way that you can help as we move forward with Tree Fort. Another way that we've been preparing is we've been fundraising. Tree Ford is completely privately funded. We rely on the support of churches like this one, of individuals who can give their money to help support the work of Tree Ford. And that's going to be an ongoing thing. We're going to need to raise an operating budget each year to be able to recreate a family for these boys. Raising children is not cheap, but that's the model that we feel is best to help these boys become healthy men and healthy adults. And so if resources is something you have, if money is a way that you give, that's an ongoing way that you can become a part of Tree Fort. The other thing that we've been, or one of, one of the other things we've been doing is uh, preparing to hire our first set of Tree Fort parents. And uh, we are accepting applications right now. We're going to be beginning the interview process later this month. And we are hiring a set of parents. It's a full-time position. One is able to work outside of the home. But these parents are really the glue that will hold Tree Fort together. They're the ones that will do the simple yet monumental things like make a meal every day for these boys. Be there when they get off the bus to give them a hug, to ask them how their day was. They're the ones that will use everyday teachable moments to help these boys build a foundation of faith. 
And, and maybe these boys will stay at Tree Fort for the long haul, or maybe they'll return back home with their family and choose another path. But wherever they go, they can come back to this foundation of faith that their Tree Fort parents have helped to build in them. The Tree Fort parents will help instill in them a love for learning. We believe that education can fling wide open the doors of opportunity, and we want these boys to have that opportunity that education can bring. And if they can learn to love to learn, we think that that is a life-changing thing. The Tree Fort parents will also be the ones that will help these boys heal emotionally from whatever it is that, that their young lives have faced. And whether that's enlisting the help of a mental health professional or simply being that one that will consistently tuck them into bed each night, they will help these boys find the emotional healing that they need. So if you or if someone you know think might be interested in hearing more about the role of the Tree Fort parents, we would love to talk to you. And like I said, yes, it's a job, but it's more than a job. It's creating a table where these boys can come and sit, where they can find a place of belonging and safety that they may have never known. One of the things I love about the image of the table is it's not just uh, a place where families gather, but it's something that Jesus spent a lot of time doing. The Jews thought Jesus was going to come to the earth uh, with a bang. They thought he was going to make a noticeable entrance, vindicate them from their oppressors, become their king, take over, defeat the Romans. The list goes on and on. But what did Jesus do? He came eating and drinking. He had a lot of meals with people, so much so that he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Jesus loved to share a meal. This table here is, is found in Luke chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me, it's the story of Levi. Levi was a new follower of Jesus, and he had invited a bunch of his friends, and he had invited Jesus to come hang out and share a meal. Not all of Levi's friends had chosen to follow Jesus at this point. And in fact, his friends were by many considered kind of the scum of society. They were hated. They were people that lived extravagant lives by oppressing other people, by cheating and lying and stealing from others. They weren't well liked. So did Jesus say, no, Levi, wait till they follow me and then we can all eat together? No. He said, sure. And he went to Levi's house and they hung out and they shared a meal. Now, when we have a meal with someone today, we can be polite and we can go have dinner and we can move on. But in Jesus' day, to sit down and share a meal with someone was a sign of acceptance. It was mutual acceptance, period. And Jesus went to Levi's house and shared a meal. And then there's this table in Luke chapter 7. This is sort of the opposite. These are the religious leaders, the church people. And Jesus accepted them just as he accepted Levi's friends. You see, Jesus rose above the lines of division in society of that day. Jesus would eat with the rich and the poor. He would eat with people of any race. He would eat with the prisoners and the pastors. It was acceptance, pure acceptance. And then you might know what happens at this dinner. There's a prostitute who comes and begins to, to kiss the feet of Jesus and wash them and express her love toward him. And what does he do? He doesn't back away. He accepts it. You see, the church leaders had this understanding as they looked on they had this understanding of righteousness that would cause them to move away from a woman like this. No, 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 no. She's not one of us. But Jesus didn't understand righteousness that way. Jesus understood it to move toward people, no matter who they were. And then he has the audacity to go on and forgive her, to forgive her for a life of promiscuity, to forgive her for a life of addiction, of defiling her body and the bodies of others. He moved toward her. He accepted her love. And and gave his love back to her. The thing that is remarkable to me about Jesus is he didn't do it as an outreach, outreach project. This, this woman who was washing and kissing his feet wasn't a ministry to him. She became his friend. She, he gave her, perhaps for the first time, a place to belong. The prophets of the Old Testament also used the picture of the table. They would use it to describe the coming kingdom of God. In Isaiah 25, 6, Isaiah says, 
He describes the kingdom of God as a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines. This is going to be a great meal when the kingdom of God comes. Jesus used this picture too to describe the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 14, he talks about a man who prepared a huge banquet. He went all out. He sent out invitations. He decorated. He prepared the food. He had the finest of wines brought in. He said, my banquet's ready. And he told his servants, go, go get those people that I've invited and tell them it's time. And so his servants went out. And what did they find? Everybody had an excuse. And some of the excuses were good. I I just got a new job. I can't take the first day off. I can't come. You know, let me know next time. Or, Or another person, he had just gotten married. I've got a new wife. I can't come. And the excuses kept pouring in. And the servants came back to the master and and said, there's no one here. And he said, go back out. Go get the blind and the lame and the crippled. Those people that society rejects, go get them and bring them to my table because my table will not be empty. You see, in those days, those who were disadvantaged were considered rejected from society. There weren't equal opportunity laws. There was not handicap accessibility If you were a little bit different than the standard, you were rejected. But Jesus said, no, not at my feast. Bring them in. They're going to sit at my table. And they brought them back in, and the table was still not full. And the master says, go back out. Go behind the bushes. Go behind the hedges. Find the worst of the worst. Those people that are hiding from society because it's so bad. And bring them into my table. And they come in, and they feast together at this banquet. And again, when Jesus pictures this, It's not go help the poor. It's not go help the disabled. It's not go help the widows and the orphans. No, it's bring them in and let them be my friends. Let them sit at my table with me. Let's enjoy a meal together. Pure acceptance. And in that day when all that is wrong is made right and all that is broken is made whole, there's going to be one extravagant meal. Because when we sit at the table together, we belong to one another. What a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. There's one more meal in scripture that I want to highlight as I wrap up today. This one doesn't take place around a a table per se. It's more like a campfire. Because Jesus shared meals in all different settings in all different ways. And this one is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's after his resurrection. And so you can imagine his disciples, his friends, have been through this this exhausting time. These weeks of of their friend, their teacher, their master has been crucified. He's been tortured. He's been mocked and made fun of. And then he comes alive again, which is really crazy. I mean, we're used to the story, and so it becomes normal to us. But this guy's crucified. He comes alive again. He appears to them. There's got to be this this emotional exhaustion that they're facing at this point. And one night they decide to go out and go fishing because that's what they do. They're fishermen. So they get in their boats and they go out. They fish all night and they catch nothing. They're fishermen. They know how to fish, fish, and they catch nothing, nothing at all. And so they're tired and they're frustrated. They're probably just ready to go home and go to sleep. And they start to pull toward the shore, and they see this person off in the distance on, on the sand. And he calls out to them, and I have to wonder if in their minds they're thinking, this guy's just making a joke of us. He says, hey, have you caught anything? They're like, no, I haven't caught a thing tonight. And he says, hey, throw your nets over on the other side of the boat and try that. And in their sleep-deprived, frustrated, emotional exhaustion, they throw the net over the other side of the boat, and what happens? They start hauling in a load of fish unlike none they've ever brought in. And John, it clicks. He says, that's Jesus. And Peter, known for his impulsivity, jumps off the boat, fully dressed, swims to shore. You guys take care of the fish. I'm going to go see my Lord. And he swims to the shore, and he comes up out of the water, dripping wet, exhausted, tired. And Jesus is sitting there with a fire, a charcoal fire that's burning. And as Peter comes up out of the water, the smell of the fire hits him. This fire is spoken of in one other place in John 18, 18. It's a word that's used for the fire where Peter stood with with, uh, people on the night of Jesus' crucifixion. When he stood around that fire and they said, wait a minute, aren't you, aren't you one of the friends of that guy? He said, no, no, not me. And he's denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And as he stood around that fire, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus. I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. 
as Peter came up out of that water after trying to fish all night, the smell hits him. I can only imagine the shame that washed over him. Has a smell ever taken you back to a place? Four of my five children were in the NICU when they were born. And there's a smell that hits me every now and then when I walk into a restroom or use a certain kind of soap. And immediately, I'm back in that NICU. I'm washing my hands. I'm washing my arms up to my elbows as they made us do before I could walk in the room and, and see my baby hooked up to the wires. And that smell takes me back to that moment. And I can only imagine as Peter emerges out of the Sea of Galilee, out of this water, and the smell of that fire hits him. The shame washes over him. The sound of the rooster echoes in his ears, the words of denial burning on his lips again. But this time, the fire is the place of his restoration. Because what does Jesus do? He says, I'm cooking some fish and I've got some bread. Come, have breakfast with me. Come have a meal with me. After a long, frustrating night, come find your rest in me. After living with shame and hurt, come to me. I'm where you belong. This table is the table in our tree fort. This is where the boys will sit, but it's more than a table. More than a meal here, they will find a place to belong. They will have their seat, their very own seat. No matter how they mark it as theirs, that will be the place where they belong. Where they can begin to take the broken pieces of their little lives and put them back together so that they can become men who learn how to follow Jesus and who can contribute to our society instead of taking from it as they grow. The table is a place where broken people find connection. It's the place where we sit together where we have a physical reminder every day of the body of Jesus that broke for us so that we can each have a place that we belong. As the band comes now, I invite you guys back. Uh, we're going to take just a moment, as is uh, often the case in our service, and respond uh, to whatever God is saying to you. As Sandy shared this morning, um, maybe there's some, something that she said in one of the stories that she shared that, that pricked your heart, and you need to respond this morning. Maybe you just want to come and kneel at the altar. Maybe you would want to make a decision of faith this morning. I'll be standing down front if you'd like to come and do that. So we're going to take time uh, now to stand and respond, and then we're going to come back uh, to the table in just a moment. <laughs>